if you uh, want to ask questions, we'll, there'll be plenty of time at the end to, to, uh, to talk. Uh, you also have a button on the join me on the upper portion of the screen that says chat. You can click on that and um, type a question and I'll be able to see your questions. And I see we now have a, a number of people, so a few people are still joining now. Okay. If you want to ask questions uh, verbally, uh, you have to turn on your microphone. And I see a few of you already have the microphone on. I can see uh, a couple, so you can you can ask questions through the internet as well. Okay, I'm going to get started, and thank you all for joining today. Um, you should be able to see my screen as well. Uh, in the background here, you can um, see a, a CT scanner actually just sitting next to me, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And today's topic is uh, combing computed tomography for dental veterinarians. Um, and there's a few things to talk about is the whole program will take a, a good 30, 40 minutes. And before we jump into nice looking 3D imaging, I want to um, sort of walk you through what I'd like to cover with you today. Uh, just very briefly, so you know who I am. I'm uh, Zoan Technologies uh, president, but uh, prior to that, I was a uh, university faculty, I'm a clinician. I'm a periodontist and was in private practice until uh, 2015. Uh, in the course of doing all that, this, uh, the company started as a, as a um, NIH grant at the university. We then started the company. Um, a couple of books out there, one on dental implants, which might be of less interest, but there is a book out there on combing CTs for human oral maxillofacial applications, if you want to learn more. Um, Quick uh, review of the program. I'm going to go to a little introduction and uh, explain to you how Combing CT actually works. It matters to you as what is clinically relevant to the technology. I'm a human dentist, and you're the experts in um, in veterinary. So I may or may not. Um, what you do, but I want to share with you our experience on humans and combing CT for the past 15 years. Um, and then we'll talk about how to actually look at those images briefly. And today is really an introduction. We'll do more of the sessions probably about once a month or so, and we'll dig into more cases as we move along. Um, but for, for now, this is going to be a, an overview of how to actually uh, read these images. Uh, my objective today uh, by the time we're done, you should have a good understanding as to how this technology works and what matters to you as a practitioner. Um, we'll, you'll understand what we learned on humans and what probably will apply to you as you start using two-dimensional radiography. And we'll discuss what we've seen so far in veterinary dentistry in particular. Um, and how uh, combing CT 3D x-rays can be used in your daily practice. So a quick introduction. This is our, our company here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, beautiful day here today. If you ever come by the area, you have an open invitation. You can see how we do the um, in, in brief, this is what uh, our particular machine looks like. It's a, a mobile. 2D X-ray unit. It's self-shielded, so it can be placed in an existing room without modification of the room itself, uh, and it uh, it can be wheeled to the existing bed, and it will spin around as you'll see in just a second. Uh, this is one of our users in Florida. Uh, the machine is uh, relatively easy to move around, so you, it will slide in between your furniture, go through a regular door and it can be utilized in more than one room. So you don't have to have a dedicated room for it. 
um, you want to be able to use this uh, at the at the location where you're working, not the other way around. And here's a patient on the existing table. We do place a radiographic clear um, plate so that uh, when we bring the machine around, there is no metal in the field. And here's a quick movie that shows you the entire process of CT scanning. Um, you can see the patient is anesthetized, the machine is brought forward, we take a quick x-ray to be sure the positioning is good, and then uh, our particular unit rotates around the patient. You're seeing here the entire process of taking a CT scan. It takes about 20, 30 seconds. And you can see on the screen here that we're acquiring x-rays as we move along. And it's those x-rays that we'll then uh, utilize to make 3D uh, imaging. Um, a few seconds later, this is the sort of image you'll be seeing on the screen, on your, uh, on your coming CT screen. And we'll go over what that means, but in brief, you now have uh, three-dimensional images and cuts of those in volume. And um, we'll, we'll learn later how to read this, but briefly you have cuts in the axial, long axis of your patient, sagittal view, and coronal views. And obviously the main benefit uh, compared to two-dimensional radiography is you no longer have the issue of projection and you can start seeing cuts throughout the anatomy, not having to guess anymore um, what features can be seen in projection as compared to 2D. So how is CT scanning, condom CT in particular, uh, how does it all work, what's inside of the machine? And without spending too much time, I'm just going to show you what I think matters to you and what you do want to know uh, in terms of um, uh, the technology is there. Somebody's calling, but it's not here. Okay. So, home beam CTs and CT scan in general have evolved quite a bit since the 1970s. This is when it all started. Um, and it's evolved following the, the classic progression of computers as well. And you start to see the first CT scans in uh, the early 1970s. Initially, it was developed for brain tumors. Um, the very first CT scan uh, was performed by uh, Dr. Hansfield, who later received the Nobel Prize for it. Um, I like to mention, so everybody can remember, it was done in Wimbledon, and it does look like a tennis ball right there in the middle of the brain. So how does it work? We take an x-ray, very much like what you know, it's, uh, it looks like a regular dental x-ray tube on one side of the machine. The x-ray beam tra traverses the anatomy and the detector on the other side will capture that information. And the anatomy itself will stop the x-ray beam. And depending on how much of that is happening, we'll get a certain amount of energy of x-rays on the other side. If we do this repeatedly, thousands of times as we rotate around the anatomy, we now have different sets of data, and it's that data that we can analyze uh, to create a 3D image. And this is true for any CT scan, well, traditional scan uh, in the early days, as well as more advanced scanners today. Um, ultimately, we scan a portion of the anatomy which we call field of view. And the field of view is not to, to um, confuse with the size of the detector. The field of view is what is being imaged and what resulting uh, volume of image we have on, on the screen. We also define what's called box cells, which is a three-dimensional pixel size. And that is that smallest area of X-ray volume to which we give a, a gray value. And this voxel being three-dimensional has three values, an X and X. Now, the good news is, uh, let's see if I can take it off from here. 
Yeah, if, you, if, if everybody can turn off their microphones, I think we can hear it a little better. Hopefully, it doesn't interfere too much. Um, so, box cell size, they are, um, there is a benefit to cone beam in general. If you are now sending your patients out to conventional CT, there's a chance that the uh, image quality is not the same in all directions. And that's because conventional CTs um, tend to have a box cell size that is greater in the Z direction, in the long axis of the patient. But cone beam CTs being flat detectors, as you'll see in a second, don't have that problem. In other words, the voxel size, the image quality is the same in all directions because the voxels are what we call isotropic. They are the same in all directions. Now, this gray value to that small volume is a sign a number. We call this Huntsville units. Uh, and it's an arbitrary number. It's uh, named after this uh, Nobel Prize. Um, this uh, uh, physicist who first uh, invented CT uh, scanning. And it's an arbitrary number. Water is given the number zero. It's uh, about minus 1,000. And everything else follows. The so soft tissue tends to be in the zero ish area, and then bone has a denser value. And tooth structure being so dense, of course, is going to be. You know, much in a much higher uh, value of home skills. Condim CT in particular uh, works along the same principles, but it uses an X ray source on one side. This is an old picture of one of our machines before it existed. Before it was a machine, it was in the lab. Um, it has a regular X ray source on one side, a flat detector on the other side. And that's really one of the key elements of the technology. The best way to think of this is um, a reverse engineering of a flat screen TV. And most of you do have uh, a large flat uh, X-ray detectors for your two-dimensional radiography. It sort of uses the same, except this time the detector is more sophisticated because it can capture a lot of images very, very quickly, many, many times per second. We now take this technology and put it in one of our scanners. This happens to be uh, one of Zoan's uh, machines. It's an upright unit for human patients in uh, mostly otolaryngology practices. Uh, and the machine contains a flat detector, as you can see here on the image, the X-ray source on the other side. And it's going to rotate around the patient just one rotation only. And it's going to acquire a number of projections. It will be hundreds of projections, maybe 300, maybe 600 projections. We take that same technology and put it on the uh, the VetCat, which is the the Combin City, um, uh, Zoan Combin City veterinarian. And it's the same principle. You can see on this image on the left a patient under general anesthesia, and below it is the flat uh, screen detector size opposite to it as you can see on the image on the right you have the x-ray source that will project onto the detector and again this machine as it shows you in this picture is sitting like this uh, it happens to have shielding inside so it is safe to be next to the machine behind the machine when we take x-rays and those panels on the side are lead shielded, so it also is safe to be somewhat on the side of the machine. The field of view, as we were mentioning just earlier, is important. Um, for veterinary, pure specialty, you want to have a relatively large field of view. And this blue box here shows what we do with VETCAT as compared to smaller ones. In fact, our other unit for humans for um, private practice uses, does use a, a slightly smaller detector because of what of the need. But for, um, for dental application, dental veterinary application, that larger field of view matters a lot because that's how you're going to capture all of the information you need. Uh, we'll go back to the voxel size again in just a moment because it happens to be something that people bring up quite a bit. 
But in our case, we can go as low as 0 0.1 millimeter in the cell dimension. <clears throat> and here again, a little bit more information about block cells. The detectors themselves have their limitations. So 0 0.1 millimeter is quite reasonable. Um, anyone, any manufacturer could make this box cell size even smaller. But what that means is we're taking a cube and split it in even more pieces. It doesn't mean that you have more information. It just means that we are splitting cubes in smaller cubes. And this diagram, this picture on the lower portion of the screen shows you that even if you were to take even smaller pixels of that screen, the contrast in between those lines in this phantom uh, plastic material, it has its own limits. So a smaller pixel of uh, white versus white isn't going to help you. It matters more that we have uh, clarity between the lines in this particular where we take a phantom and we have metal line, lines embedded in the plastic to see how much we can discern the lines as they get closer and closer from right to left in this, in this example. Uh, the other element that matters with condensity is contrast. And the best way to illustrate is what you see here on the screen. On the left side, we've embedded little cylinders with different densities in what, is, uh, what would represent the brain. Condensity in general have a bit less of contrast as compared to conventional CT. Uh, however, with good algorithms and uh, advanced software, you can get decent contrast as you get into soft tissue. But you should not expect the same sort of contrast on convention as compared to conventional CT. And condom CT tends to have a bit less contrast in the soft tissue area, uh, which happens to be less of a concern with dentistry because most of what we look at is, uh, is um, in heart tissue areas. The last element is uh, noise. Um, and when you look at images and you evaluate the sort of equipment, uh, you do want to pay attention to the noise uh, because uh, it has to be treated well for you to discern areas, uh, small areas in particular. So what have we learned in humans? <clears throat> Um, I want to go back 15 years ago. This happens to be my first patient. This, is, this was the first patient on the first prototype of a human cone beam CT. And I was uh, at the time using two dimensional panoramic x rays and PAs, of course. Those metal balls show the location where I wanted to place dental implants. But interestingly, the very first area we looked at happened to have a periapical lesion on the tooth adjacent to a potential site for implant, which you can see very clearly on this uh, cut. This is buccal here on the left. This is lingual here on the right. And you can clearly see this periapical lesion that I had missed completely on two-dimensional radiography. Uh, over the years, we've seen uh, uh, a lot of applications. Of course, this is just another one that you see more than we do, but we, we do see it quite a bit on humans, and that's root resorption. Here is a case where two-dimensional radiography did show a root resorption, but I couldn't tell the location or the extent of it. But with combined CT, you can now see whether it's invaded the root canal area, the location of it, and the extent of it, which has a huge impact on treatment, obviously. Here's another example of a, a smaller root resorption, the sort that you see uh, more on your patients than we do. Uh, it has a small entry, and it's in this particular case invaded the root canal area. Uh, it's a pretty bleak diagnosis for this particular tooth, uh, and this would be very difficult to diagnose and evaluate properly on, on two-dimensional two X-rays. Uh, here's a periapical radiograph. First molar, we're on the upper left uh, maxillary quadrant, upper, upper left area of a patient. And this uh, two-dimensional radiography doesn't show much. We have a benefit with humans because humans come with symptoms. And this x-ray, I didn't see much. There's a little bit of a shadow on the x-ray. But once you take a, a condensed CT, this is buccal, this is the palate, 
uh, on humans, we have the maxillary sinuses, a bulb, that molar tooth, but obviously you see a lot of pathology, a huge amount of resorption, a periapical lesion on the buccal root, and this gives a, a clear diagnosis and a clear prognosis for this particular tooth. Again, here's a difficult area to diagnose with an invasion of uh, root resorption on the distal aspect of the second molar uh, at the maxilla as well. Here's uh, one of many, many examples of a trauma case. This was a young patient that came to me uh, after a, a, a basketball had um, hit his uh, upper left lateral area. Have much symptoms, but a combing CT clearly shows uh, micro fractures throughout the tooth. They become very, very obvious, and the, the diagnosis uh, follows very, very clearly. Here's another example of a patient who comes with symptoms. We're, we're on the upper uh, right quadrant this time. We're looking at the first molar, second molar, and third molar, the wisdom tooth. The, the periapical radiograph doesn't show much. But once we take a combined CT, we see a very large lesion centered on the palatal root, which is difficult to see on two-dimensional x-ray. We can see that it's slightly invaded the maxillary sinus by, by pushing the, the floor of the, the sinus. And here's another example where the, the PA shows a pathology on a distal aspect of the second molar, also on the upper right quadrant. This time we see a very large lesion that has invaded the maxillary sinus with um, thicker uh, tissue, and is also a communication with the floor of the nose. Here in this image, we're looking at the floor of the nose. And yet another example, one that I think you're gonna see more and more, um, and that is um, uh, after root canal therapy, two-dimensional radiography shows a very nice looking X-ray. But then you take a 3D and you now see a pretty large periapical lesion on one of the roots, which has invaded the floor of the maxillary sinus. Here's another root canal on the mandibular left second premolar. The periapical x-ray looks fine. But then when you look at 3D, you see a, a thickened periodontal ligament, something that you'll start learning to read more on, on three-dimensional radiography that you don't see much of on 2Ds. But this is very indicative of a pathology and a communication with the root. And that's because the root is an H shape and there is a stripping. In other words, there is a communication between the root canal and the periodontal ligament. This tooth is actually failing, although when you look at the 2D x ray, you see nothing wrong. Um, this work that's been done over the years, this is a publication we did you know, more than 10 years ago on the evaluation of bone level for periodontal disease. We've measured that, and obviously, once you have 3D, you can evaluate uh, bone level and frication involvements <clears throat> more precisely with 3D as compared to 2D. Sort of lesions like, uh, like cysts, benign lesions, as well as uh, invasive tumors uh, can be evaluated very clearly on three dimensional radiography. You now can measure them, figure out their location, see how much they've invaded adjacent teeth, adjacent teeth if need be. This is a very common finding on humans where we have a benign, well-defined cyst that can be approached buccally. It also helps you with the surgical approach because you can decide to go buccally or lingually as an approach. Obviously, this one here, this is buccal, this is lingual. The buccal approach is a lot more efficient. Uh, with trauma, um, you see that quite a bit in maxillofacial surgery. Three-dimensional radiography allows you to evaluate fractures as well as evaluate the reduction of fractures with your plate. As you can see here, um, an orbital plate in place. Right of the screen is plate for reduction of, zy of zygomatic fracture. And if you look carefully, you see, in fact, that this reduction was incomplete. There is a gap between those two pieces of bone here. And this is a perfect time if you take an intraoperative imaging to go back and complete the surgi surgical procedure more precisely. It takes only a couple more minutes compared to leaving that space. Open. 
So let's switch and let's take a look at a couple cases together so you can see how we read images. Um, of course, that would take a bit more time, but very quickly, I just want to show you um, how to navigate CT scans. I'm just opening a case uh, as you're looking at it. It's relatively quick. And you're looking at various uh, sections of the patient. You can go up and down in sections. So those three quadrants show the sagittal cut, axial cut on the lower left, and coronal cut on the upper right. We have the ability to navigate through the cuts up and down. The uh, positioning of the patient on cone beam CTs is a little bit less critical than it is on conventional CT. And that is because we can modify the position of the patient in three dimensions and correct for slightly uh, mispositioning of the patient during scanning. And it's true in all quadrants. So you can reposition your patient first and start to navigate through the spaces by uh, sort of dragging lines and looking for cuts. Now, it takes a little bit of getting used to if you've not uh, looked at many of those uh, CTs. But quickly, you'll get, um, you'll get very comfortable looking at the cuts, which are more diagnostically important than the 3D rendering, which I'm going to bring up now. Um, and you can navigate in all areas. In our particular software, uh, the lines sort of tell you where you are, but you can keep your bearings with the 3D rendering, which you now see on the lower right. And so you can see the lines moving. So if I'm moving one of the lines, you'll see in 3D where you're at, because the, the cut is going to also show on the three-dimensional rendering. So you can you continue at all times to know where you are. You can also grab the 3D and cut through, through that as well. So you can analyze areas on the three-dimensional radiography uh, rendering, although truly the diagnostics is going to come from, from the cuts themselves. If you have questions about this, we can go back to some of those cases a bit later. Okay, let me um, go back to a bit more information. I want to show you um, a few examples of the sort of patients you're going to see and what you what to expect. Here's a, a three-dimensional rendering again of uh, of a, uh, a patient, and I want to point to a couple of details that you are not seeing in two dimensions that you you're going to have to get used to in three dimensions. Uh, so, slight little uh, learning curve here because there's, so, there's more details. One of them is the ability to truly see um, bone level and bone thickness around teeth. Um, so here again, to give you the orientation, we're looking at a cut of teeth uh, on the right portion of the screen, buccal area. On the left, obviously, this is the, the nose and the palatal area. You can now see for the first time this buccal bone that can be very thin, and you'll be able to analyze this. But more importantly, you're also going to see the thickness of the ligaments. And that thickness is going to be a little bit new to you in terms of what you're used to seeing in two-dimensional radiography. And that is because you now see it in, in great detail. It's going to vary in thickness throughout the same tooth. And it's going to give you an indication of tooth movements and sometimes trauma. So for example, this lower example that shows a ligament that looks a little thicker, on the two-dimensional radiography, you'd worry about it. But in 3D, you don't, because this is, this is normal looking uh, ligament. Um, the uh, other benefit of um, uh, 3D x-ray is the ability to look at this in a very different way than you're used to seeing in, in two dimensions. And here's an example where you can literally sort of make a cut. We'll look at how we do this with um, software tools. But you can make a, a virtual cut on the screen and the long axis 
of this canine, for instance, which otherwise would be difficult to do. And you can analyze this tooth in a very different way that you're usually um, not able to see. And that allows you to look at your pathology or treatment. Here's an example of uh, endodontic therapy. And once it's completed, you can take a 3D X-ray of it, look at um, the root canal in the long axis of the root. In other words, you can trace the long axis of the root and look at it that way. And you can ensure completeness of the endodontic um, apical area. You, you'll start seeing areas that are not filled completely, and so on. In this case, it looks pretty good. There's just a little bit of voids on the most uh, incisal portions. Root resorptions, again, just like humans, you're going to start seeing them in a very different way. You'll be able to detect them probably earlier. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to diagnose them at a stage where they might be able to be treatable. Um, uh, being a human dentist, I'm interested in seeing the extent of them and whether they invade the endodontic space. When they do, then you'll uh, probably start seeing leakage of bacteria to the periapical area, which is exactly what happened in this particular case. You see a bacterial leakage, so now you have no longer, not more than just a resorption, you also have an endodontic failure. Um, with regard to bone level around his parental disease, uh, you're going to see more details in terms of bone level around the roots. Uh, the angulation of the x-rays is a bit less, is less critical in 3D because you can adjust for it. And you'll start seeing bone loss between uh, roots. And uh, that, those areas, I think, are going to be very, very critical to you. They sure are on humans because the diagnosis and the prognosis of the survival of this teeth changes quite a bit as, as soon as um, very radicular areas are involved. Here's another view of the same, uh, a nicer looking 3D rendering, uh, which gives you the same information where you can see an advanced parental situation with quite a bit of bone loss. This would be, of course, very obvious on two dimensional radiography, but this is sort of showing you the extreme. Other details we'll start seeing more precisely are potential communications. Here you can see the uh, periapical area of a, of a molar in direct contact uh, with the, uh, the floor of the orbit. And if there was any sort of pathology here, you'd clearly see it uh, coming through. It would be very easy to diagnose. Here's an interesting case. Somebody here who's attending today might actually recognize it because it's, it's one of yours. Um, an interesting surgical approach to this embedded tooth that uh, was to be extracted, but it's difficult to evaluate exactly where it is in three dimensions. Whereas if you have um, a 3D X-ray, you can take clear measurements um, of the access you'd like to, to um, obtain to get to that tooth. And you can go clinically and do those measurements very quickly. You can access it by figuring out the height, the width, the depth of that tooth very clearly on three dimensions. Other areas of interest that I think you see as much as we you know on humans, and that is the ability to see the temporal mandibular joints more precisely. Uh, you'll see spaces in three dimensions and 3D renderings that will allow you to evaluate potential pathologies very clearly. And you know, this is a, a, a 2D cut uh, of an image again where you can see clearly the, the TMJ space and the, the extent of it. And if you were to lose that space, like we've seen on some cases, if there is sort of uh, fusion of, or loss of space, that would be very difficult. Another view of this in the uh, buccal, sort of buccal lingual or anterior posterior uh, dimension. Um, other areas of interest are going to be pretty obvious to you. This is a, a large pathology invading the nose. Unfortunately, this is an invasive lesion. Ear pathology is going to be uniquely defined on three-dimensional radiography. You're going to start seeing a, a lot of details. Here is just one of many examples 
uh, right and left uh, areas, and you can see soft tissue invasion as well. I'm going to go quickly. Um, and we're here to help. Uh, I think this is a, a learning curve clearly in reading three dimensional radiography. I'll go back to another one more case just to uh, illustrate one more point here. Um, but in my experience, it takes about uh, 10 or so cases to be comfortable navigating in three dimensions um, and a, a couple months of training in your office once you equip yourself. Um, and then it, it's going to become a, a routine piece of equipment just like everything else. I just want to quickly show you one more example in three dimensions. Another case. Again, I'm just pulling it up. You see how quickly this can be done. You can hear um, see two sort of CTs of the same patient, more and more posterior scan. I just want to point out to this particular uh, tumor here, I'm adjusting the position of the patient quickly. And I'm sort of zooming in, and I can see the invasive lesion on the uh, upper left uh, palatal area. And if you feel like we don't, we need another image, that's okay. That can be done relatively quickly as well. Um, it's possible to take more than one CT. It only takes a few seconds, 20 seconds. So here's a different location of the scan, and now we have an even better view of that particular lesion. Okay, I want to thank you all for your participation. Uh, again, this um, this uh, uh, session is recorded, so if you've missed some, we'll be sure to send you a link. Um, it's been a, a very positive experience for those of you who equip themselves with three-dimensional radiography. This is one of our um, early adopters, Dr. Kenfield in Florida, who is a dermatologist, actually, and does a lot of ear uh, CT scanning. And he's found it very useful for his practice. Um, I want to call for your uh, your attendance. If you have any questions, you can do this now um, through that little button on the upper portion, or if you can like it. Uh, you also have my email on the screen now, as well as our Zoan email. And please do send questions or anything we can do to help. Any any questions? You're welcome to type a question. If you if you don't know where it is, I'm going to try to show you. Um, it's on the upper left portion of the screen. There's a little button that has a little chat here. And I see one question here. Can you speak to differentiation soft tissue versus fluid use of contrast? Okay, great question here about soft tissue versus fluid. So you're going to be able to see soft tissue versus fluid uh, decently well. Uh, mostly because of, of uh, the fact that fluids will show what we call a water line, but you are otherwise um, uh, heading towards a, an interesting question. It will be somewhat difficult um, to truly see the difference if you have sitting fluid. So, for instance, in the, in the nose area, if you have fluid versus soft tissue, you're going to see the difference because of the shape of the outline of the soft tissue. But other than that, the contrast of it is going to be similar. And you, your other question related to the use of contrast is, is actually a, a, a very um, a timely question. Um, Condim CT has not been used much with contrast at all. Uh, it can be done. It's still sort of in the, in, in the works. Um, I think your experience is going to help us figure out what the timing of it is. The main difference between condim CT and conventional CT is the speed of scanning. It does take about 20 seconds to scan to take the full image, whereas a, a, a conventional CT spins very, very fast. So we're going to have to learn the uh, timing of contrast, uh, uh, so at the time of injection versus the time of scanning and learn exactly how long we should wait before scanning and how quickly we should, we should scan. So that, the, the book still has to be written 
on that topic. And um, I'm hoping in the next few sessions, in a few months from now, with your experience, we're going to learn what the proper timing will be for, for contrast. Okay, another question here. Oh, great. So here's an answer. Thank you for answering the question, since you seem to have uh, more experience than I have uh, with injection. And that, that does make sense. So your answer, I'll read it to everyone, is that you've used it three, four times with, uh, with injection. It seems to show up well. And that's great news. Um, it makes sense. There's, there's no reason why it, it wouldn't show up. It's just like any CT scan. Um, and I'm glad it's, it's, it shows well. I'm, I'm curious, maybe you can share with the group um, now or later your experience in, in timing and whether it's the same for, for every patient, maybe your smaller patients versus your bigger patients. But um, it does make sense that um, injection of contrast would, would show well. So thank you for that information. That's actually news to me, so that, that's great. Thank you. <clears throat> If everyone, if anyone has a microphone on and wants to ask a question, you can uh, you can go ahead now, and I can repeat the question for everybody to hear. Okay, I think that's um, that's all we have for today. Again, this session is going is recorded. We'll send it out uh, to you. Please forward it to all the folks who couldn't join today. Uh, we'll keep your email and phone information for the, the next uh, questions. Oh, I see one more question. Question on the widened parental ligament. Um, I'm just gonna wait for another second so I can see the question and I can go back to one of those cases. Um, so the significance, okay, great question. So the significance of widened parental ligament and is it painful? So, <clears throat> The answer of it is most of the time when you see this sort of regular widened parental ligament like I showed you in that image, it's, it's not significant. It shows you that the tooth is working and moving. Um, the sort of widened parental ligament you should be worried about are those that are more like a balloon, in, obviously in the periapical area, or just like that human premolar area that I showed you where you have a clear sort of one location that is much wider than the more um, apical or cervical areas of, of the ligament. Other than that, if you have a, a regular sort of well-defined widened parental ligament all throughout the root or an entire tooth, um, that's normal. I've actually noticed that on the maxillary molar teeth of your patients, you'll see them almost all the time. Um, on that on that larger molar, and that's completely normal. That's not painful to my knowledge. At least on humans, we see this all the time, and it's not a problem. And it's only uh, significant if it changes over time. In other words, if you worry about a pathology and you start seeing a significant change in one particular area of the ligament over a course of uh, maybe six months or a year. All right. Very well. Well, thank you so much for, for your questions. I hope I've answered them all. If you have more questions, don't hesitate to uh, send them over by email or call us. You have the information on the screen. Thank, thank you, you all. Uh, David, this is Jim Barrett with Dental Focus. Um, can everybody who's on today uh, let us know, is there a better time that we should do these conference calls? Um, just to give us an idea. Uh, we we want to continue to do this with different cases and try to share experiences and, and common uh, questions and concerns. So if people would just kind of ping back on that before they get off, that would be great. Thanks. And did you see the original email from Zoran or did you get an email from us? What what was the best way to communicate with you? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I'll, I'm just going to... Uh... Repeat the question if, if some of you have couldn't hear it. Uh, the question is, when should we have the sessions uh, so that it's more convenient to you? Today it's sort of midday, and I hear that um, um, afternoon is better, 5 p.m. West Coast time. That's fine. We could, we'll do that. Um, we'll, we'll work late on our side. It's gonna, it'll, be, it'll be good. So probably next time we'll, we'll get a little survey 
if you don't mind sending the information over so we can time this, uh, this session a little better next time. Very well, thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of your day.